Hello everybody and welcome back to polynomial functions as part of the advanced functions course. Today I will be showing you chapter 1.2 of the McGraw-Hill textbook which is the characteristics of polynomial functions. Of course the whole chapter just covers different characteristics but I will split it up into two parts. The first part will be the general parts of polynomial functions as well as even odd functions. So let's begin. Key features of graphs of polynomial functions. A polynomial function of degree n, where n is a whole number greater than 1, may have at most n minus 1 local and, and maximum points. So what that means is those little hills on top of a function can only occur n minus 1 times. So let's look at this for example. We have 1, 2, 3 which is n minus 1. So this should be a quadratic. This is 1 and 2, so this could be a third degree function. Let's go back. Uh, for any polynomial function of degree n, the nth differences are equal and or constant. Uh, have the same sign as the leading coefficient and are equal to the following expression, which can be written as a times n factorial, where a is the leading coefficient. So you could use the above expression to find the finite differences, which is the difference at which values are all equal. Another major point is that the x-intercept of the polynomial function can be easily found by making f of x equal 0, which you should know from last year. And finally, polynomial functions may have absolute maximums and minimums, as well as local maximum and minimums. Again, this might be a little bit confusing, so we'll try to elaborate. The absolute max and min is the point where the function reaches its greatest and or smallest value. And the local max and min refers to the point at which the function reaches the max or minimum in a selected region of the graph. So let's go to the graphs I showed you. So for example, here, you can see that we have one, two local minimums. Because in these areas, that's the minimum value. And over here, that's a local max. We could also see that this function has no absolute max because it reaches positive infinity. And it has one local min and one, well, it has one. You could also see that this function has no uh, absolute max because it reaches positive infinity on both sides. However, it does have one absolute minimum, which is this point. As you can see, the graph never goes below that. The same goes for this graph. We could see that we have one local max over here and one local min. We have no absolute maximums or absolute minimums because we reach positive infinity over here and negative infinity over here. So let's look at the examples over here. Find the finite differences of the following functions. So, f of x is equal to 4x squared plus 12x minus 4. So what you can do is easily plug in the expression from two slides ago, which would be a n factorial, so a is 4, n is the degree of the function, which is 2, 2 factorial is 2, 4 times 2 is 8, therefore the finite differences would be 8. For g of x, a is negative 1 and n is 3. 3 factorial is 6, and then negative 1 times 6 is negative 6. Therefore, the finite differences are negative 6. Uh, so let's go to the next example. Using the following information, find the degree of the function and its leading coefficient. So for these questions, all you have to do is go down and find the differences. So negative 10 to 4, the difference is 14 plus 14, this is plus 2, this is plus 2, and this is plus 14. 
basically keep on going until you reach that. All of the full solutions will be shown in these videos over here, which I will link to, as well as I will link to the PowerPoint. Okay, so let's move it. Key features of even degree polynomial malfunctions. Okay, well, if they have a positive leading coefficient, the graph will extend from quadrant two to quadrant one. The range would be y is any real number, where y is greater or equal to a, where a is the minimum value of the function. So over here, a would be over here. And as you can see, it never goes below that point. Also, it must have at least one minimum point. For example, let's look at a parabola. It always has a minimum and then it goes back up. If it has a negative leading coefficient, then everything gets reversed. So now it extends from quadrant three to quadrant four. There are ranges y is an element of all real numbers such that y is less than or equal to a, where a is the maximum value. I need to fix that up. Let's do that. Maximum value of the function and it has at least one maximum point. So even degree polynomial functions may have a zero. Well, we have from zero to a maximum of n x-intercepts, where n is the degree of the function. So again, if we considered a parabola, we know it could start above the x-axis and go down and go up, or start below the x-axis and go down. So of course it would have zero um, roots. The domain of all even functions is x is an element of all real numbers because it's defined for all values of x. And even degree polynomial functions may have a line of symmetry. Key features of odd degree polynomial functions. For a odd degree polynomial function, if it has a positive leading coefficient, then it starts from quadrant three and goes up to quadrant one. If it has a negative leading coefficient, again, it gets flipped. So now we go from quadrant two to quadrant four. Odd degree polynomials have at least one x-intercept to, to a maximum of n x-intercepts where n is the degree of the function. Again, if we, let's say, look at the graph of y equals x, we know that it will cross the axis at least once. The domain of all de odd degree polynomial functions, x is an element of all real number, and the range is y is an element of all real numbers. Odd degree functions have no maximum point and no minimum point. Odd degree polynomial functions may have a point of symmetry. Finally, this is the homework for today, which I will show you in a couple of seconds. Okay, well, let's start with the homework. So the first question we had was question one. Each graph represents a polynomial function of degree three, four, five, or six. Determine the least possible degree of the function corresponding to each graph. Justify your answer. Okay, well, let's look at the first one. It has one, two, three turning points, which if we add one, two, it would be a fourth degree polynomial function. This one has one, two, three, four, which would mean this is a fifth degree. This one has one, two, three, which is another four. This one has one, two, three, four, which is another five. And this is a one, two, which is a third. We could tell that by looking at all of these, that nowhere did the degree six come in, but that shouldn't be a big problem because we did find the least possible degree of the function so let's look at two. I'll refer to question one. For each graph, do the following. State the sign of the leading coefficient, describe the end behavior, any symmetry, and state the local, state the number of minimum and maximum points and the local minimum and maximum points. How are these related to the degree of the function? Okay, well, let's we'll start with question with part A. The sign of the leading coefficient has to be positive because if we think of a quadratic, it goes from quadrant two to quadrant one. 
uh, that is also its end behavior. Uh, there is no symmetry because we can tell that this part is much smaller than this one. The number of maximum points is zero because it reaches positive infinity. It has one uh, absolute maximum, oh, absolute minimum, sorry. Uh, it has one local maximum over here and two local minimums. Uh, let's look at B. So again, we could easily see that this is a positive coefficient because it's going from quadrant three to quadrant one. It has no symmetry because these parts are not even. It has no maximums and no minimums, like absolute maximums. It has two local maximums and two local minimums. This one is a negative leading coefficient because it's the reflection of A. We know that it has uh, one uh, absolute max and no absolute mins because this reaches negative infinity. It goes from quadrant three to four and it has two local maxes and one local minimum. Uh, for D, it's a negative polynomial function because it goes from quadrant two to quadrant four. It has no symmetry, neither does this one, which I think I forgot to say. It has no absolute max or absolute min. It has two local minimums and two local maximums. Lastly, E, it's again negative. It has a point of symmetry because it looks like around over here, the function is exactly the same. The, it has no absolute max and no absolute min. It has one local minimum and one local maximum. And that is it for question two. Uh, let's look at question three. Use the degree and the sign of the leading coefficient to describe the end behavior of each polynomial function, state which finite differences will be constant, and determine the value of the constant finite differences. So I've assigned A, C, and E. Now let's look at them in order. f of x is equal to x squared plus 3x minus 1. The end behavior of the function would be due to its degree and its leading coefficient. The leading coefficient is positive and the degree is 2, so it's an even function. So then it is going to go from quadrant 2 to quadrant 1. The finite differences will be the second degree. So the second differences would be the ones that are equal then the value at the constant finite differences. Okay, so the leading coefficient is one, and then the uh, top, then the degree of the function is two, so one times two factorial is equal to two. Therefore, the answer is two. Let's look at C. So the degree is four, and it's negative, Therefore, it's going to go from quadrant 3 to quadrant 4. Then, since it's a 4th degree function, the 4th de the fourth differences will be equal. And now we have to do the constant finite differences, which would be negative 7 times 4 factorial, which, if you don't have a calculator with you, I will tell you is negative 168. So, now we have... E is pretty simple. This is a degree of 1, so that's a straight line with a negative leading coefficient. So it's going from quadrant 2 to quadrant 4. The finite differences would be the first differences that are equal, and the way you can tell which ones are going to be uh, the difference is going to be negative 1 times 1, which is negative 1. Uh, question 8. So for this question, I think it would be better for us to go to a grid paper. Okay, so let's first read the question. 
A snowboard manufacturer determines that its profit, P, and thousands of dollars can be modeled by the following function, where X represents the number and hundreds of snowboards sold. What type of function is P of X? Well, we could tell that it's a polynomial function because we have a super power for X and then a constant. Without calculating, determine the which finite differences are constant for these polynomial function. What is the value of the constant finite differences? Explain how you know. Okay, well, we already know that the nth differences will be the same, therefore the fourth differences would be the same. Uh, what is the value of, the, of these finite differences? Well, okay, so what we know is that a and factorial is how you find the finite differences. So A in this question is equals to 0 0.00125 and N is the degree of the function which is 4. Therefore A and factorial sorry, equals to 0 0.00125 times 4 factorial which is equal to 0 0.00125 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 is equal to well, let me quickly do this 0 0.5 times 5 is equal to 0 0.03 therefore that is where they will be the same. So C asked us to describe the end behavior. So we'll say this is B, this is C. Again, as I said over here, this is a positive, this is an even, therefore we would have something along the lines of this, which would be from quadrant two to quadrant one. The part D asks us for the restrictions on the domain in this situation. Well, since we're talking about profit and we're talking about manufacturing something, we know that X could be an element of all natural numbers because it can't have half a skateboard, so it should be N. And then X could also has to be greater or equal to zero because you can't manufacture negative skateboards. Uh, so E asks us, what do the x-intercepts of the graph represent in this situation? Well, if the x-intercepts are the ones that make the function equal zero, then that would mean that the profit would be zero at those intercepts that many snowboards okay uh, and lastly F what is the profit from a sale of 3,000 snowboards well we know that in the question it said that Uh, X represents 100 snowboards. Therefore, if we're selling 3,000, that would mean 30 X's, right? So then what we will actually do is P of 30 is equals to 30 plus 0 0.001. 2, 5 times 30 to the power of 4 minus 3, which is equals to 139.5. Again, we got to remember that in the question it said that this value is in thousands. So, our final answer would actually be 1. Zero three nine five 
zero, zero dollars. There you go. That was the worst exclamation mark I made so far, but that is our answer. Okay, well, let's move on to the next question, which is question 11. The volume B in cubic centimeters of collection of open top boxes can be modeled by the following function, where x is the height of each box in centimeters. Graph V of x and state the restrictions. Okay, so let's do that. Let's delete all of this. And begin. So we know that v of x is equals to 4x cubed minus 200x squared plus 28x. Okay, so this might be a little bit advanced since we didn't learn this yet, but using what we have learned from last year, we could first begin off by trying to factor this, which we can do. We could remove the 4 from all of the things as well as the x. So 4x is equal to and then minus, let's quickly divide 220 by 4, 55, x plus 700. Can we do anything with this? Oh, let's try, so 4x, and then something that multiplies to 700, and adds so to negative 55. This might take some trial and error, but let's do something quickly. Okay, you could of course use the quadratic formula, but you could also have found it by simply plug and play, and or just simply thinking of 700 and 55, you know, those two numbers, what could multiply to 7, like a 35 and a 2. Uh, so 35 and 20 would be 55, so it has to be negative because we have plus and negative, so this is x minus 35 and x minus 20. Okay, so now that we have here these values, we could do a simple sketch. We're not going to know the full thing, but we could do a little sketch. We know that our zero is at zero, at zero, at 35 and 20. So let's say this is 20, and this is somewhere at 35. This is not to scale. We know that the this is a third degree function and that it also is a positive leading coefficient so going from quadrant three to quadrant one so we're doing something along the lines of this well that didn't go through the 35 let's try again again these are going to be smooth lines when you draw them hopefully it's a little bit difficult to do it on a screen so that's around what the graph should look like uh, since we're talking about volume, we should try and restrict our function to only this part over here. So the domain would be x is an element of all real numbers because you could have a little bit less than a centimeter, like a millimeter, where x is greater or equal to zero. And the range is y is an element of all real numbers, or y is greater or equal to zero, because we can't have a negative volume. Okay. So part B asks us to find. Oh, well, we already did that. It says to fully factor it. That's how we graphed it in the first place, because it didn't say didn't say to use a uh, graphing uh, calculator. So we're done A and B. Uh, and then state the value of the constant finite differences for this function. 
Okay, so for this function, we know that a is equals to 4 because that is the leading coefficient, and n is equals to 3. So let's do that. We have a n factorial is equals to 4 times 3 factorial is equals to 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 is equals to 24. Therefore, the finite differences will be 24. Okay, well, let's look at question 13. By analyzing the impact of the growing economic condition, a demographer establishes that the predicted population, P, of a town T years from now can be modeled by the function as follows. A. Describe the key features of the graph represented by this function if no restrictions are considered. So, let's think about this. We have a fourth degree function with a positive leading coefficient. Uh, we know what the y-intercept will be when t equals zero. So the y-intercept is 12,000. We know that we should have t minus one max in, uh, turning points. So we could have three turning points. We know that the function will be moving from quadrant two to quadrant one, because again, we have a positive leading coefficient and an even degree. Um, we could also factor this and find at what point the function is equal to zero, but you could do this on your own. We know that the t value would be any real value, and the range we would have to figure that one out by graphing it. Which, you know, let's actually do on a quick graphing calculator because, again, this will be covered more in depth later on in the chapter when you actually learn how to graph polynomial functions. So let's do that now. I'm going to quickly type it in into decimals, which hopefully you have gone to know by now because it is actually a really helpful tool. So let's do this. The only thing is you have to change the t values to x's because that's how the program works. So let's go. This is what we're getting. Uh, let's expand it. So let's say like negative 10 and then 10 and then let's run something like this. This is what our function looks like. It also tells us that our minimum is actually over here, which is pretty fun. Okay, so let's move on with that. Um, what is the value of the constant finite differences? Okay, well, let's go back. So again, we should have gone rather familiar with this procedure by now. We have a n factorial which equals to a was 6, so 6, and then the degree was 4, so 4 factorial is equals to 6 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. This is 24 times 6. 24 times 6 is 144. Therefore, 144 is the finite differences. Uh, so c is asking what the current population of the town is. So to so T is equals to zero because no time has passed, right? So we have six, zero to about four. Sorry, let's actually write the full function, not just expression. P of zero is equals to six zero to the power four minus five zero to the power of three plus two hundred 
plus 1200, which is, of course, a wine intercept of 12,200. Yay! This is not, uh, this is just to signify the hand answer. Okay, so D asks us what the population will be from 10 years from now, so T is equal to 10. So P of 10 is equal to 6. 10 to the power 4 minus 5, 10 to the power 3 plus 200 times 10 plus 12,000, which is equal to 69,000. It's pretty nice. Uh, and finally, it is asking us what the population will be when the population will be approximately 175,000 people. Okay, let's do this. Of course you could graph it and then find at what point the thing would be, but I always like to just equate it and then see if it could be solved algebraically first, because usually teachers don't really like you using technology, especially for questions like this when it says not to use it. Of course, sometimes that's the fault of the textbook. So, what can we do here? We could rewrite it. So, this equation is equals to minus 5t3 minus 200t minus 1753 minus 163000 is equals to 0. Okay, so considering we don't know how to do long division on polynomial functions yet, we can't really solve it like this. So we're going to go back to our favorite graph that we made. All we're going to do here is say x is, well, y is equal to, sorry, 175,000. And here we go. We know that we can't have negative values in terms of years. So in approximately 12.6 years will be that population. But since we're talking about actual years, I'll be in 13. Therefore, the answer is 13 years. Lastly, let's look at 17. It says to use technology, but I don't think we need it because this question seems rather straightforward to me. So, what type of polynomial function is each of the following? Justify your answer. There's a little bit you could do with this. Uh, of course, you could just see that this is 1x times 1x times 1x, which together would be x to the power 3. Therefore, this is a cubic function. Again, we have x squared times x, which is still a cubic, and this is, of course, a cubic, so all of these are cubic functions. And then it's asking us to graph each function. This is where the tech needs to come from, but let me tell you, this is from like a few chapters ahead, and all you have to do is figure out what is the difference here what makes them different we know that f of x could equate to zero when x is equal to negative 4 1 or 2.5 negative 2.5 for this function here it's negative 4 twice and then 1 and here it's just negative 4 three times so if we were to graph it that's exactly what you would see uh let's do that right here Let's delete these and quickly do this. x plus 4 times x minus 2, 1, and then 2x plus 5. Sorry. Negative um, 50, maybe 50. There you go. That's our first function. Then we just take this. This becomes 2 power of 2. We delete this part. We see that 
for this function, we have a 0 at negative 4, and at 1, we had a negative 4, a 1, and a negative 2.5, like I said. And then lastly, we can take this, and then this one becomes cubic now. Sorry. To the power. Oh, got deleted. I'm so sad. We have one zero, which is at negative four. And here they're all together, and we can see that they have the same domain and range. They're all going from quadrant three to quadrant one. And that's about it. Uh, describe the relation between the x-intercepts and the equation of the function. Well, like I said, the x-intercepts are just a factored form of these. So in this, as we said, it's negative 4, 1, and negative 2.5, which is right there. So for this function, we have negative 4, and then 1. And for this one, it's just negative 4. Well, that concludes the lesson for today. Thank you, everybody who has tuned in. I hope you have learned a lot from today's lesson. And as always, I will continue making these videos to help you learn more. Bye-bye, guys.